goals too. And usually that thing is something to do with work. These days I'm writing a book, so I'll often make, try and make progress on the book, or maybe try and think about writing a YouTube video or speaking to someone on the team on Slack. But I was reading an article by Clayton Christensen in the Harvard Business Review called How Will You Measure Your Life? Which basically talked about how if I were to spend that one hour of extra time each day instead working on either my health or relationships, then and that was the intentional default, then how different would my life be? Like an extra hour of progress on my book or on making a freaking YouTube video for this channel isn't really gonna have a big impact at all. Like I don't struggle to get work done. I already spend eight to 10 to 12 hours of the day quote working. But an extra hour of the day spent trying to reconnect with friends or do something intentional with relationships, that has a big impact. And I've been testing this out over the last couple of weeks where in that one hour slot, I will go through my WhatsApps and reply to unread messages. <laughs> or, you know, the other day I organized um, a little birthday kind of celebration and had a few friends come over for brunch. And all of that I managed to organize in the space of about 20 minutes. Whereas before I, I didn't, if, if I hadn't been thinking intentionally about like, what is, the, what is the default action here? What progress can I make on the relationships and friendships front? I probably wouldn't have done that because I would be like, oh, birthday, I don't really care about birthdays, it's all good. But it was great and I'm really glad I did that. And so, you know, as I'm sitting here reflecting on this, I'm thinking, it's a Saturday. I've got some time after this. I should actually, instead of thinking, I'll make some more progress on my book because I've already done 4,000 words today. Instead, just think, you know what? Let's spend half an hour to think about how I can reconnect with a friend who I haven't spoken to in a while. So, intentional defaults. Secondly, I want to talk about the idea of lowering the bar. This is quite nice, quite nice place. Uh, yeah, the idea of lowering the bar. And I find that this has been one of my main strategies for dealing with procrastination in that if I'm struggling with procrastination of any sort, usually it's because my standards are too high and usually because I am trying to be too much of a perfectionist. And one of the phrases I like from writers is there is no such thing as writer, writer's block. There is only like perfectionism or something like that. And I think something that Seth Godin says, which I find quite helpful is like, if you think you have writer's block and you can't do the thing, then show me all of the bad writing that you've done. And usually chances are you haven't done any bad writing because your standards have been so high, your perfectionism has been so high that you just haven't created the thing. And in the context of making a YouTube video like this one, and in the context of starting a podcast or a business or making progress with an essay or an assignment or anything, if we're finding ourselves unable to start, I find that for me at least, telling myself, just lower the bar, embrace mediocrity, like just try and embrace that this thing is going to suck and that's okay because once you get started, then it's way easier to continue going. You know, Newton's first law, the law of inertia, an object at rest continues to stay at rest, but an object in motion tends to continue to stay in motion. And so I find that lowering the bar helps me at least get started being in motion. All right, number three is somewhat related, and that's the idea of embracing mediocrity in certain things in our life. Now, I really like this idea from Oliver Bergman's fantastic book, 4,000 Weeks, which we've got a video about linked over there, and the podcast interview that I did with him is sick. That'll be linked down below for the Deep Dive podcast. By the way, did you know I actually have a podcast? I interview people. It's cool, link down below. Anyway, his whole idea is that like, you know, when we, in the world of productivity and stuff, we think that like, if I just had the right tools and systems and processes and discipline, I would be able to do all, the, all of the things. But his whole spiel in the book, which I completely agree with, is that like, time is finite. Like, <laughs> we're gonna die at some point. There physically are not enough hours in the day to do all of the really important things that we wanna do. And therefore, we just have to embrace mediocrity in certain parts of our life. So for me, I have embraced mediocrity in the sense that like, like work-wise, I know I'm not gonna take my website seriously. Like, probably could. I, know, I also know I'm not really gonna take TikTok seriously. I probably could. I also know I'm not gonna be overly active on LinkedIn. Like that's like easy things on the work front. Those are the things that I choose to be me mediocre at. But in my personal life, again, sort of, <laughs> I, I have sort of dozens and dozens and dozens of unread messages on WhatsApp. And I've just embraced mediocrity in that I'm, I'm, I just suck at replying to those. Well, in my intentional default time, I might get around to it at some point and be like two months later, I'll reply to a friend being like, hey, let's arrange to meet up because I like meeting up rather than text messages but I've just embraced mediocrity in that side of my life and I'm not trying to, I'm not beating myself up because I suck at replying to text messages or anything like that. And I think that's, that was a really nice thing that I got from, uh, from Oliver, Berkman's, Oliver Berkman's book. Next on the life lessons list, we have the idea that um, studying or working or just living life with a background music track is actually pretty fun and makes life a lot more high energy. When I was living in Cambridge and I had my kind of Alexa smart speaker systems and stuff set up, Anytime I'd wake up and I'd just be roaming around the house, I would always just like, ooh, I can kind of do this. Yeah, whenever I'd be roaming around the house, I'd be playing some kind of background music of some kind, like, you know, Alexa, I'll play my liked songs on Spotify or play songs by One Direction or Take That or Taylor Swift or Ed Sheeran or anything. There's something about having music in the background that just really, really energized me. And I've noticed since moving to London where we've kind of got an Amazon Echo, like the Alexa set up in the living room, but I don't have one in the bedroom. And it's just like, just a little bit more friction because I haven't gotten around to setting up all the things. Where now I actually don't have that much background music in my life. And 
I'm not sure, but like I do find that my energy levels when I'm around the house are lower than they were when I was living in Cambridge. And similarly, when I go to the studio, we have like a big Amazon Echo studio there. And sometimes the music is off just by default because it's just off. And I find like, huh, why am I, why am I struggling to do this thing? Or like, you know, write a script for a video or, or whatever. And then I think, oh, there's no music. And then I turn the music on. And then suddenly it's like there's like an injection of energy into the room. I don't know. I just find that if, I, if, I've, if I'm feeling low, low on energy, if I'm feeling like I'm struggling with, with, with a thing, putting on some kind of music just seems to, seems to help. Next, we have a very standard life lesson that everyone who is aware of personal development and stuff knows, but always needs reminding of, including me, which is that um, consistency and quantity generally leads to quality. You know, if you want to get good at painting, then just do 100 paintings. If you want to get good at making YouTube videos, make 100 videos and they're going to suck, but like you'll get better at making them. I think I, I made this mistake when I was dabbling with songwriting, where I would be like really precious about like a single song and just be like, oh, I need to get this perfect. I need to get this good. And so far, I, I don't know, I've written maybe 0.5 songs because I haven't embraced this attitude of just like quantity leads to quality. And if I want to take something seriously, just, just got to do that. Even when it comes to going to the gym, just like, you know, putting in the consistency is in a way way more important than like an individual workout being like particularly good. So generally when it comes to the gym as well, I just tell myself that as long as I've gotten to the gym and lifted at least one thing, then that's a win. And I will log that in my app. I use the app Strong, by the way, which is great for tracking workouts and not sponsored. And as long as I've done at least one thing, that counts, that's legit. And that helps me kind of maintain consistency with the gym a little bit more, even though that's still something I very much struggle with. The other thing that quantity and consistency leads to is creativity. Seth Godin, for example, used him as an example a couple of times. He has had a daily blog, like a, blog, a vlog with a B, since like 1995 or something. So for the last like 25 years, he has been writing every day. And there's something sick about that. Like the more you do the thing, in a way, the more creativity flows from you. And, um, you know, this, I think Ed Sheeran does this in songwriting, Neil Gaiman does this in writing, where it's like, in order to be creative, you have to let all of the crap flow out first. Kind of like um, if you have crap in your plumbing system, if you want the clean water to come in, you have to get rid of all the junk first. And getting rid of all the junk first requires you to just have a lot of ideas. And so I think I've really found this with when it comes to doing anything daily, doing anything daily in terms of like content or anything creative, just I found makes me way more creative than I would be otherwise. Life lesson number seven, changing gears, is that sending physical thank you notes feels really good for me and also for the person who I've sent the physical thank you note to. And so I have a little stack of thank you cards with stamps and envelopes. And I haven't yet found a post box that's close enough to my house that makes it super low friction, but there's something about sending a handwritten note that just feels amazing. And with our YouTuber Academy, we send, we send handwritten notes to all our students and they freaking love it and it's great. Um, yeah, handwritten notes, fantastic stuff. Next we have the idea, the life lesson, the philosophy that planning and doing are two different modes of operation. One metaphor I like to use that my brother came up with is the pilot and the plane. At some moments of the day, we should be the pilot where we're trying to figure out and we're planning what to do with our day. But then for the rest of the day, we should be the plane, i.e. we're just executing on the orders of the pilot. We're not trying to think about it too hard. It's when, at least for me, and I found this for my students as well, it's like when we try and be the pilot and the plane at the same time in the same sitting, it's actually quite hard to get started. Like that's where procrastination really strikes. If it's like, oh, I need to, I don't know, learn Japanese. <laughs> and it's like, uh, okay, I'm gonna work on my Japanese. Where it's like, I haven't planned what, that's, what that actually looks like. I don't actually know what I'm doing. I don't have clarity on what that objective is. I haven't done the pilot stuff. And that means when I sit down to learn Japanese or improve my Mandarin or whatever the thing I'm working on, I don't do anything. Cause I'm like, oh, it's just too much of a faff. It's like going to the gym and not having a plan. I don't want to come up with the plan where I'm, when I'm at the gym because then I'll just sit on my phone and scroll, scroll, scroll because it's way too hard. But if before going to the gym, I can come up with a plan and be like, all right, once I get to the gym, here are the things I'm gonna do. Then when I'm at the gym, I can just be the plane and I can theoretically execute on the orders of the pilot. So I find that separating planning and doing has been really helpful for me in terms of beating procrastination. And next we have the idea of choosing to be satisfied. Like a bunch of other, like, I don't know, high achieving productivity bro enthusiasts. I tend to get to the end of the day and often feel as if I haven't done enough. Like I could have done more. I could have been more efficient, more productive. I could have worked on something more meaningful. Could have spent less time scrolling through social media. That's just a bit of a weird thought pattern because me feeling dissatisfied with what I've done doesn't actually change what I've done. It doesn't change the, the reality. It just makes me feel bad. And so if instead I can just simply choose to feel satisfied with the progress I've made in a given day and what I've done, then I get to the end of the day feeling good. And it's like in both, both situations, the reality is identical. It's just that I feel differently about the situation and I feel way better when I choose to feel satisfied with what I've done rather than beating myself up that I didn't work hard enough. Some people will say at this point, oh, but like if you're dissatisfied, then you'll be more likely to work the next day and work harder. I'm like, nah. 
I'm really not. Like, I feel like every day is a new day. And <laughs> on the days where I feel dissatisfied with my progress, that doesn't mean that the following day I'll make loads more progress. If anything, it leads to a negative spiral where it's like, oh, I didn't do very well today. Oh, well, you know, tomorrow can be a chill day as well. And then the next day can be a chill day. Like, you can choose to feel satisfied with what you're doing. You don't have to choose to feel dissatisfied with it because it doesn't really change the reality of what you've done. All right, next lesson that we have is the idea that when making decisions in our life with what we're doing, how we're spending our time, who we're spending our time with, we want to be trying to move towards things that energize us rather than the things that drain us. And I found this to be a useful mental model for you know, let's say if I am thinking about, oh, you know, I've been invited to this party. Weird, I know. But let's say I've been invited to this party and I'm thinking, oh, I don't really feel like it. The, the question I ask myself is, okay, will going to the party energize me or will it drain my energy? Now, depending on the party and depending on my, my energy levels, there are some times where going to the party will in fact energize me and so I'll do the thing. But at other times where I know that going to the party will, will, party will actually drain me and therefore I will, I will choose not to go. And I found that usually if, you know, just, just that one question, will this energize me or will this drain me? And if I have the option then going towards the thing that energizes me is always the thing that I, 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 I appreciate. You know, if I'm feeling a bit tired, I'm like, oh, I could go to the gym. Will going to the gym energize me? Almost certainly. There is no way in hell that going to the gym is not going to energize me. Therefore, I will try my best to go. Similarly, filming a video like this, it's kind of a bit dark in the house. I couldn't really be bothered to film in the house. I was like, oh, maybe I'll film a video, maybe not. Then I thought, hang on, what if I film the video outside? Will that energize me? I was like, yeah, that's going to energize me. So it's great. I'm here filming this video and, you know, not really caring about the fact that there's birds in the background and like the lighting is changing and stuff because I don't think anyone really cares. But either way, I'm finding it energizing to be out here speaking to a camera as if I've got a friend and it's great. All right, next life lesson is that fantasy fiction books are absolutely amazing. Everyone who have recommended the Mistborn series by Brandon Sanderson to has absolutely freaking loved it and has become a Brandon Sanderson fanboy for life. Would highly, highly, highly recommend. Uh, Mistborn series is a great place to start. Stardust by Neil Gaiman. If you're looking to get into audiobooks, Neil Gaiman narrates that audiobook himself as well and he's a sick audiobook narrator, so that's amazing. Anything by Brandon Sanderson is just absolutely next level. If you're looking to get into fantasy fiction, 100% recommend those. It's got on Audible, it's got on non Audible or Kindle or paperback or whatever you want to read, but I tend to listen to fantasy fiction on Audible and it's it's amazing. Next we have the lesson of that. <laughs> you should I learned I learned this at the age of like 26 or 27 or something. I think it was my old housemate Sheen that taught that taught me this. When you're washing your face, you should like wipe your face not with the same towel that you use in the shower. Because the towel that you use in the shower goes into weird places and you don't want those weird places to go on your face because then you're gonna break out in like spots and stuff. Since she told me this, I've, t I've been testing it out and I now use face towels or face tissues to wipe my face if I'm wiping my, f wiping my face. Or if I don't have access to a face towel or face tissues if I'm out and about somewhere, I just I will just sort of pat, pat dry it with my hand and then not like actually use my bath towel to dry my face. And I've actually found my skin's been a lot clearer since then. I used to have like m way more spots on my nose and stuff when I was when I use the shower towel. I sometimes use, use a shower towel and I'm just like, I always regret it the following day because then something always breaks out. So yeah, thank you Shane for that tip. Use a face towel rather than a bath towel. All right, the next life lesson is that uh, skincare is something that definitely compounds over time. I've been chatting a lot to my friend Osama, who's a dermatologist based in New York. I'll put a link to his YouTube channel down, be down below. And he and I have had a lot of chats about skincare. He basically showed me a bunch of evidence that shows that basically the younger you start caring about your skin, the more legit your skin looks over time as you age. And so now I have a proper skincare routine, which we're making a video about at some point. It'll be linked down below if it's ready by now. A skincare routine, basically sun cream, moisturizer, and retinoid are like the main things. And then cleanser is like an optional extra. So those are like the four parts of my skincare routine. And I have a moisturizer and sunscreen that's rolled into one so that I only really use two products in the morning. Basically, basically I cleanse and then I use the sunscreen moisturizer. And then in the evening, I will use my retinoid my moisturizer and people have been commenting on how nice my skin looks so yeah I mean I've been doing the skincare routines in, for about six months now ish and I feel like it's already making a difference quick thing bonus little life lesson is that to be honest one of the main lessons that I've learned in the last 28 years is a lesson I learned five years ago and that was to start my own YouTube channel now if you've been interested in potentially starting your own YouTube channel the absolute best way to do that is to take my brand new online course which is freely available on Skillshare called YouTube for beginners and thank you so much Skillshare for sponsoring this video if you haven't heard by now Skillshare is an incredible platform with thousands of online classes taught by teachers from all around the world on all sorts of topics from like YouTubing, entrepreneurship, lifestyle design, interior design, tech, cooking, stoicism, productivity, loads of stuff. But the best part about Skillshare is that I have been on Skillshare since 2019 and I've got about 12 classes on Skillshare. One of them is my flagship three hour long course, YouTube for Beginners, which is completely free to access. So if you are one of the first thousand people to hit the link in the video description, then you can check out that course completely for free along with all of my other classes. I've got three classes all about productivity, which includes some 
some of the life lessons that I've learned from previous years when it relates to productivity and just generally being a more efficient person. I've got two classes aimed at students for how to study for exams, and all of those are freely accessible during the one month free trial to Skillshare. So do please hit the link in the video description and then you will get free access to those things. So thank you so much Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And the next life lesson is to try and wake up at the same time every day, even if you've had reduced sleep. I've been, again, I've been doing a bunch of research into the science behind effective sleep, listen to a bunch of Huberman lab podcasts about this. And there's just like a lot of decent compelling evidence that says that even if it's the weekend, try and wake up at the same time. Like the more you can train your brain and body to sleep at the same time and wake up at the same time and not have lions and stuff, the more like the, it, the your body knows about the adenosine buildup and the circadian clock like seems to work properly. I found this as well. Like now I wake up at like 7 a.m. every morning uh, really without an alarm or wake up like a few minutes before my alarm, which feels really nice because I tend to wake up very rested. But on days where I'm like, oh, I'm, I've slept at 1 a.m. because like, or 2 a.m. because I had friends over, etc., etc. Let me have